decide that we're going to keep the exam on November 2nd. I'm um, sorry, I know that that gives you less information if you're thinking about dropping. Uh, so I apologize. So I, I like to have three exams. But the overall majority of the students wanted to keep it on November 2nd. I, I sort of prefer that too. So we will keep it on November 2nd. But I'll send a message out to the whole class regarding that. But it's as it's scheduled on the syllabus. All right. Um, and I think that we are done. Oh, and by the way, that, that's also good because it makes the last exam a little bit less material. Because if we move it up a week, like I was proposing, um, it would just give us a long time between the third and fourth exams and puts a lot of material on that fourth exam. So that's, that's not real great either. So I prefer it anyway to have it on the second. Um, I think that we have finished all the TV examples I wanted to do. But there are some more practice problems for you to do in the homework. Uh, problem number, what was it, um, problem number six, problem number five is a good one to practice, that, although that's a one-body problem. You could see a one-body problem on the test, but you'll also see a two-body problem for sure. Look at the old test, too. There are some good examples that are similar but different to this one with an inclined plane with two bodies. Uh, have some variations on those that you can take a look at. Any questions about the these Newton's laws problems with two bodies, TV problems? Not right now. Uh, make sure you take some time to practice them. If you do have questions, we can readdress them as you work through those various problems. But look at the old exams. There's a TV problem on practically every exam. Make sure that you can work through those. Uh, if you need extra practice problems, just shoot me an email. I can send you some. Okay? Let's move on to the next chapter. The next chapter I think you'll find is considerably, uh, I don't want to say easier, but it is a little easier than the previous chapter. In fact, this chapter and the next chapter, I think that you will find it to be a lot simpler. Uh, students tend to do better on the third exam than they do on the fourth exam, just FYI. Um, on energy and work, this chapter. We're also going to see a new tool called the dot product, which you'll get to in Calc 3, those of you that are chem majors. And I guess engineering majors, too, take Calc 3. Is that right? No? Okay. Well, we'll see a new tool that we'll use for vectors called the dot product. But first, just a little bit about energy. This is sort of grade school stuff. You studied energy, right, in elementary school, junior high, high school, the various types. Yeah, so you sort of know what I'm talking about. We have lots of different kinds of energy. Uh, in this chapter, we're going to be discussing the energy associated with motion, uh, so-called kinetic energy, yep. or that associated with the potential for motion, and you know, we'll call that potential energy. Uh, collectively, we call these uh, mechanical energy. And it's in contrast to a variety of different other types of energy, uh, thermal energy, nuclear energy, chemical energy. Although you chem majors, you'll take a whole course on thermal physics or thermal chemistry in, in P-Chem. I think it's the second semester. I'm not sure. Anyway, you'll take a whole course on this, and you'll see that the basics of thermal physics are, are based on the ideas of, of kinetic and potential energy. And you'll look at how the uh, how you can model a system of particles as a si uh, model an, a gas as just a system of particles, each particle having a certain amount of energy, kinetic energy. So you'll see this stuff. Uh, at least in some form later when you go into PCM next year. Okay, let's look at the dot product. Uh, the dot product, it's also called the scalar product. Now, first of all, the dot product is just a tool. It's a tool that allows you to take two vectors and multiply the components of the vectors that are in the same direction. We have the knowledge to do this now, but this just helps to formalize how to multiply the components of two vectors that are in the same direction. 
And we have a couple different ways of using this in physics, and this is one of the ways that we'll see would work. So you do get this in the Calc 3, but it's not really any more complicated than anything that we've done before. You're just taking one vector and multiplying it times the component of another vector that's in the same direction. Okay, um, let's see. So the dot product over here. is the product of the magnitude of one vector with the component of a second vector and the component of the second vector is in the same direction as the first vector. So this component of the second vector is in the same direction as the first vector. So for example, if this is my vector A, then I want to take, and this is my vector B here, I want to multiply the vector A times the component of the vector B that's in the same direction. Nothing fancy here with vector multiplication. We're just multiplying the magnitudes of these vectors. So the magnitude of A times the magnitude of BX in this case. And in order to get that, this is how we represent the vector product, or excuse me, the uh, dot product. The dot product is just a dot b, and it's going to equal to the magnitude of a times the magnitude of, as we've drawn here, bx, or, in more general terms, a times b, the magnitude of a, the magnitude of b, times the angle between them, the cosine of that angle in between them. So nothing more complicated than that. The magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the, uh, the angle cosine theta, or the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. And this allows you to take, multiply these two vectors, the component of one of which is in the same direction as the first. It doesn't really matter if one is on the x-axis or not, so I could just as likely have the vector A right here and the vector B right here and the angle theta would look like that, then the dot product would be exactly the same. Okay? It's just a tool. Don't be freaked out by it. It's just a tool that allows us to multiply two components of vectors that are in the same direction. Now, when the vectors are in vector notation, as we'll often have, the uh, we just multiply out the vectors, the components of the vector with FOIL. Just remembering that these things are true, that I dot I is equal to 1, because if you think about the vector i, it's in the x direction, and it has a magnitude of 1. So i is in the x direction, and has a magnitude of 1. So when I multiply, or I take the dot product, i dot i, this would be the same as saying 1 times 1 times the cosine of the angle between them, but they're in the same direction, so it's going to be the cosine of 0. And that's equal to 1. In fact, j dot j will also be 1. You have j and j. In a similar way, they have magnitudes of 1. The angle between them is 0. k dot k is also going to equal to 1. i dot j, on the other hand, here's i, here's j, because they have an angle of 90 degrees between them and the cosine of 90 is equal to 0, then that dot product of j dot i or i dot j is going to equal to 0. i dot k is going to equal to 0. j dot k is going to equal to 0. k dot j is going to equal to 0. Anytime I have two orthogonal vectors, you know what orthogonal means? Uh, perpendicular. Orthogonal means perpendicular. Uh, anytime I have two orthogonal or perpendicular vectors, my dot product is going to equal zero because the angle between them is 90 degrees and the cosine of 90 is zero. Or you can think of it as I have these two vectors. There is no component of this vector that's in the same direction as this vector. And the dot product is the component of two vectors that are in the same direction as one another. Adrian. You know, we haven't used K very much, have we? We we'll use it more later, but let's go ahead and let me go ahead and tell you. So in our coordinate system, I have the x, y, 
in Z axis, the Z axis comes out. X is I, Y is J, and Z is K. So sometimes you'll see the coordinate system represented not as X, Y, Z, but as I, J, K. Chem majors and PCHEM, you'll use the spectrum notation more in representing vectors. It makes working with vectors a lot easier. Okay, so let's do this dot product. I have these two vectors, 2i plus 3j, 1i minus 2k. Remember, i is x, j is y, k is z. I just want to know the dot product of these two vectors. So the way you're going to do this is you're going to do FOIL. So do a dot b. equals 2i plus 3j, that's our vector a, dotted with 1i minus 2k. You'll multiply it out by FOIL, remembering that i dot i equals 1, j dot j equals 1, uh, k dot k equals 1, and all others are equal to 0. Only like terms are equal to 1. All others are going to cancel out. So you could probably look at this without doing FOIL, but I'll multiply it out. But you could probably look at this and tell me what the answer is. Can you tell me what the answer is for this? It's going to be 2. That's right, because I have 2 times 1, i dot i, and then all the other terms are equal to 0. I'll write it out to show you. But all the other terms are equal to 0. It's going to look like this. I have 2 times 1, i dot i. And when I'm following FOIL, you all have heard that before, first, outer, inner, last. Uh, 2 times 1. Uh, let me write it as a little x. It, so it's not a dot product anymore. It's just multiplying two numbers. i dot i plus outer, which is 2 times negative 2. I'll just write that as negative 4, i dot k. Uh, inner, 3 times 1, k dot i, or j dot i. And last is negative 6, j dot k. But all these terms are going to equal to 0 because they're all perpendicular or orthogonal to one another. So my final answer then will be 2. i dot i will equal to 1. And a dot b then, the dot product is going to equal to 2. It's a scalar quantity with no direction. As you're learning, yeah, I want to. Yeah, I didn't. It was sort of in this and so on. All right, anytime I have two vectors that are perpendicular to one another, like j, which is in the y direction, k, which is in the z direction, there are dot products going to equal to zero. Okay? So a dot b is equal to 2 here. Um, as you're learning, Calc 3, 2, that a dot b is equal to b dot a. It doesn't matter the order that you give. What's that called? Uh, the commu is it commutative? I don't, do y'all know? Remember what that's called in math? I forget the property. Is it commutative? Like two times one is equal to one times two. I think that's it. Anyway, you can switch the order. It doesn't matter about the order. That's important. Not so much now, but later when we do cross products in a couple of chapters, which are similar to dot products, we'll find that that's not true. But in this case, you can switch the order. You have to do a dot product on the exam in, in the context of work. I'll give you a force and I'll give you a displacement, and we'll find that work is equal to the dot product, and you'll need to find the work that's done through this method, through finding the dot product of two vectors that are written in vector notation. Okay? Questions about the dot product? You're going to have to do it. We'll do an example later, but uh, it follows the same procedure. I just follow FOIL. Oh, I can just recognize that this is the only term that is going to equal to anything because it's the only one that has i dot i. There's i dot i here, and then all the others are some other combination, which is going to equal to 0. 
right, that product, you feeling rich? It's a good tool, actually. It'll come up with work. It'll come up in other places, too. Uh, actually, no, this might be the last place that you see dot product. I don't think we see it next semester, either. Okay. All right. Um, so let's, we're going to apply that in the context of work. Um, work is done when a force is applied over some distance, or over some displacement. Remember, this is a vector, and displacement is also a vector. Uh, to calculate the work, we multiply the magnitude of the force. times the component of the displacement which is in the same direction as the force. So that should ring a bell to you. I'm multiplying, I have two vectors that are off in different directions. I want to multiply one of the vectors times a component of the other vector that's in the same direction. That's our dot product, right? Uh, so our work then is going to equal to F dot D. And based on our definition of our dot product, it's going to be F D cosine theta. By the way, I talk about this up here that you multiply the force times the component of the displacement. You could also just as easily say that you multiply the displacement times the component of the force. Those are the same thing. It just depends how you think about it. You're always going to be multiplying the two vectors times the cosine of the angle in between them. And by the way, in this, as you work through some problems, you might have to figure out the angle. But if the angle is given between F and D, that's the angle that you use. There's not really any other angle that you would report. So whenever you're working these problems, the angle that's given is the angle that you'll use. You're not doing any 90 minus theta business. Sometimes you might have to figure out that angle. Like instead of giving you the angle between them, I'll give you uh, the components of the vectors or something along those lines. You might need to find out the angle. But if an angle is given, that's the angle that you'll use. So notice here, let's say that I have a block and I apply a force to it and that causes the block move over a certain distance, then if I want to figure out what is the work, the work is going to equal to this force, the component of this force, times this distance. So it would be F times delta X, which is our distance, times the cosine of the angle theta. The work that's done on that is equal to F D cosine theta. Can I go down from here? Yep. Uh, when F and D are parallel, remember work is equal to F D cosine theta. When F and D are parallel, what is theta equal to? That is, if F in the is in this direction, D is in this direction, what is the angle between those two vectors? It's not 90, right? It's zero degrees. By the way, if the two vectors are anti-parallel, what is the angle between the vectors? 180. Just want to remind you your values for cosine, because we'll be using them some. The cosine of 0 degrees is equal to 1. If you forget these, you can always put them in your calculator, but it's good just to have these in your mind. The cosine of 90 degrees is equal to 0. The cosine of 180 degrees is equal to negative 1, and the cosine of 270 degrees is equal to 0. You can think about this as what the x-axis is doing on our unit circle. So this is 0, 90, 180, 270. You can think of our, our uh, what's it called, the unit circle, that this is 1. Our x-axis is in the positive 1 direction. The x-axis here is 0. x is equal to 0. I think about this as x equal negative 1 at 180, and over here, x is 0 because, you know, you're on the y-axis. And by the way, the cosine of 360 is equal to 
is equal to 1, right? Because it's the same as the cosine of 0. Okay? All right. You don't have to remember those, but it, it might help you to be just more familiar with these dot products as we're going through them. Um, so when f and d are parallel, work is just equal to f times d. If those two forces are, are parallel and in the same direction, uh, the unit for work is the joule. In fact, sometimes you'll see that the unit for work is a Newton meter. If you're looking at other texts, you may or may not see that. People are sort of different in the units that they use. But a joule is equal to a Newton meter. You should be able to see this, by the way. If you look at, think about the work equation, f times d times cosine theta, that the work is equal to some newton times some meter, and the cosine of theta doesn't have a unit. So it's just going to be newton meters. Be able to also break this down into its basic SI units, remembering that f equals ma. So a newton meter is going to be, let's see, what is that? It's uh, kilograms, meters per second squared, times another meter from D, which is going to be kilogram meter squared per second squared. You can see that in the multiple choice part of the exam. Don't try to memorize it. Just remember what is the equation for work, and then you can figure out what is the, the basic SI unit. By the way, Beginning with this chapter, you will have an equation sheet. That equation sheet is on your uh, on the website. I think it's in the back of your workbook too. Am I right about that? Do y'all know? Right, the very last page. I'm pretty sure that I put it in there. Yeah. So just be aware, you'll get that equation sheet on the exam. I recommend that you just print it out, and as you're going through the homework, as you're going through the old exams, that you uh, just be aware of what's on that on that equation sheet because you'll have these things for the coming up the upcoming exam, all right, and for the final as well. So just be familiar with what's on it so that you know what you need to memorize and what you just need to what you not need to worry about. You just need to know how to use. There's very little that you'll need to memorize other than the, the strategies that we'll use to approach these problems. Okay. Um, if there is no force, or excuse me, if there is no displacement in the direction of the force, then there is no work that's being done by the force. Remember, work equals F dot D which is equal to F D cosine theta. Uh, if there's no displacement, that means that D is equal to zero, or there might be displacement, but not in the same direction as the force, or perpendicular to the force, which would mean cosine of theta would be cosine of 90, which is also equal to zero. Let me show you an example. Just imagine that you're, you have an object, and you're moving it, say you have this bucket, and you move it, you're applying a force to this object to keep it up. So I am applying a force in this direction. And then let's say that I move it in this direction at a constant dis at a constant velocity, meaning no acceleration. That means that there's no work being done on the object. Uh, that the total work that's being done is equal to zero. Because you're exerting a force, but uh, the force is perpendicular to the displacement. So my force say I look at this force, I have F in this direction, X or D is in this direction, and so the work done by those is F dot C, but any time I have two perpendicular vectors, the work done is zero. We'll talk about that. We can actually have multiple forces that act on an object, and some of them will do work, and some of them might not do work, but here I'm just talking about this particular force, right here, acting on this object that is moving in a direction that's perpendicular to the object. So my work on that object is equal to zero. Okay, work is a 
vector or scalar? What is work? Is it a vector or is it a scalar quantity? It's a scalar quantity because it, it doesn't have a direction, right? We talked about vectors and scalars. Vectors have a magnitude and a direction. Uh, scalar quantities only have a magnitude. So work is a scalar quantity with no direction. Now, we will have a sign to work. That means we can have positive or negative work, uh, such as dissipative forces. So dissipative forces also do work, like friction, but they generally do negative work. Because the displacement, well, imagine that I have an object. I'm applying a force in this direction. I have a frictional force, Fk, in this direction, and my displacement is in that direction. Why would this force, mathematically, why would this force be doing negative work? Think about this in terms of the dot product. Work equals F dot G. Or in this case, it's X. I'll call it X. Why would this have a negative work? It could be fx, cosine, or theta. What about this equation makes it negative? If I have my force fk and my vector x there, let me write that as the frictional force. What about that equation makes it negative? What is it, Liz? That's right. So my angle is 180, and the cosine of 180 is negative 1. So mathematically, it works out that this is a negative work because the displacement and force are in opposite directions. That is, theta equals 180 degrees, and cosine of 180, as Grace said, is equal to negative 1. Okay, so now you're thinking, actually you're not, y'all all look very, very sleepy. What's up today? You're not usually this sleepy, even at 7.30. Is, there, is anything going on? Was there a party last night? Nobody invited me to, or was there? We used to have these, where I used to go to school, we had these uh, middle of the night pep rallies where they'd come into the dorms and they'd wake everybody up and everybody would pour out of the dorms and out into like the quiet area. Well, this huge pep rally right before football games. It was fun, actually. We should do that. So I'm like, huh? Yeah, everybody came out to. <laughs> well, maybe I'll have a pep rally last night. Did you? No. Okay. Um, what was I saying? Oh, now you're thinking, well, gosh, you just said that work is a what type of quantity? It's a scalar quantity. And before, whenever we've had a vector quantity, we've used the sign to represent direction, right? Positive is to the right, negative is to the left, positive is up, negative is down. And now you're saying that work can have a negative value. But you're saying that work is a scalar quantity. This is really the only scalar quantity that we'll ever encounter that it can have a positive or negative value. And it doesn't have to do with direction. The positive or negative value has the meaning of what does the work do to the energy. And we'll get to this with the work energy theorem. But for now, just know that uh, dissipative forces will have negative work. And I say dissipative forces. It's really friction that we're talking about. But dissipative forces do negative work. Because they take away energy. And it works out mathematically, but it's true too, that when I have a force that opposes the direction of motion, it takes away energy. 
It doesn't have to be friction. It can be somebody just pulling on an object that you're trying to pull in the other direction. You're taking away energy from that object and slowing it down. Now let's do a few clicker questions uh, from this chapter. Is it possible to do work on an object that remains at rest? Possible to do work on an object that remains at rest? Yes or no? By the way, I know it says up here to replace the lamp, but they just replaced the lamp. We're trying to get that fixed and take the message off. I don't know if that distracts you. I'm sorry if it does. But just try to ignore it. Is it possible to do work on an object that remains at rest? Let's see, we'll stop at uh, 48. Okay, remember, our work is equal to F times G times cosine theta. And if an object remains at rest, that means that the distance that it travels is equal to what? is equal to zero. So if any one of these terms is equal to zero, that means that you've done no work. So you can have a force, uh, but if your displacement is zero, that means that you're doing no work. So for example, right now, there are forces acting on us <coughs> that we're not moving, and so therefore there's no work is being done. So the answer here is that no, you can't do work on an object that remains at rest because the displacement is zero. box is being pulled across a rough floor at a constant speed, what can you say about the work being done by friction? I'll stop at uh, 30. Okay, good. B is right. Friction does negative work because almost always friction will oppose the direction of motion. We'll see one case. I think it's in the next class. No, that's not the case. Uh, did I mark that right? Yeah. So let's see. Have I told you all what they do to a frog's car when it breaks down? I get carried away. <laughs> have I told you that one? Okay, we'll get to that. Um, can friction ever do positive work? The answer to this is yes, so go ahead and put yes, and I'll, I'll explain. Usually, the frictional force is opposite the direction of motion. But you know, when I was a kid, I grew up out in the country, and we would always ride around on the tailgate of the truck with our feet hanging off the back. Do you ever do that? It's very dangerous. You probably shouldn't do it. Like, you could fall off and, and die. But if you have a truck... get the idea. Right, and here you are hanging off the back. Right. Uh, <laughs> you're riding in the back of this truck and it's moving in this direction or it starts to move in a with a velocity in this direction. What force is it that holds you onto the back of the truck? It's the frictional force. I mean you might be hanging on too, but you know, we didn't hang on. We were just yeah, having a good time. Uh, so it's the frictional force that's, that's holding you onto the back of the truck. Now, if the frictional force was in this direction, that means that it would push you off. Even though this frictional force is now opposite the direction of motion, which is what we've been saying all along, that the frictional force always opposes the direction of motion. But in this case, well, that's not true. That the frictional force is actually in this direction. And so in this case, our frictional force is actually doing work on the object, that it is causing you to move in this direction, have a force and a displacement both to the right, which would cause 
positive work. So A is the right answer. In a baseball game, the catcher stops a 90 mile an hour pitch. What can you say about the work done by the catcher on the ball? The catcher does a certain amount of work on the ball. What is the sign of that work? Is it positive, negative, or zero work? Stop at 35. All right. Uh, it is B because imagine the ball is traveling in this direction. You have the catcher's glove right here. The catcher, in order to stop the ball, exerts a force in this direction, right? The, the mitt or the, the glove will actually sort of move back a little bit. He's pushing in this direction, but it moves back in this direction. So what we have is a displacement in this direction and a force in this direction. Since they're opposite directions, that's going to give us a negative work because F and B oppose one another. Angle is equal to 180. That's going to be negative work. The ball is tied to a string and being whirled around you. What can you say about the work being done by tension? Gets a little bit into a chapter that we'll have before. But imagine if you have a string, a very long left arm, and you just whirl it around the top of your head like this. Kind of like in the lab, but straight over your head. If you have done the lab, you have some attention that you have. What can you say about the work done by tension? I think it's what is the direction of the tension force and what is the direction of the displacement. And when you get those, then you should be able to figure out what is the work. Because if they're in the same direction, that's positive work. If they're in opposite directions, that's negative work. If they're perpendicular, then that's going to be zero work. So what is the direction of the tension and what is the direction of a displacement? I'm going to give you a little hint because we're all over the board here. In this case, as I've drawn it, the displacement is towards you. So if I look at it from overhead, this is overhead. Here's my ball. Here's my string. The displacement vector will always be in this direction. And as it moves around, the displacement vector here will be in this direction. Over here, it'll be up. But it's always going to be tangent to the circle, the displacement vector. A priori, you don't have any reason to know that right off. Uh, we will get into it in Chapter 7, I think. I'm going to stop at 155. 155, change your answer if you like. A lot better. Awesome. A is right. The displacement vector is in that direction. The tension vector is in that direction, so it does no work at all because they're perpendicular to one another. I think I have to win that one. There's no way. Hey, uh, what do you call a bear with no teeth? Okay, I don't know. A gummy bear. <laughs> okay. lift the book with your hand in such a way that it moves up at constant speed. While it is moving, what is the total work being done on the book? I'm going to think about it for a second. I'm going to help you out just a little bit. On this book, you have a couple forces. This is the force due to the hand going up. This is the force weight going down. It tells you that you're moving at a constant speed 
and the acceleration then is zero. Because you're moving at a constant speed, that also means the acceleration is zero. Okay, so then I want to know what is the total work being done on the book? What is the, there are several questions that we can ask. What is the work being done by the force of the hand? What is the work being done by the force of weight? And then this question is asking, what is the, the what is the work that's being done by all of the forces? Okay, we could call this the net work or the total work. What is the total work being done on this object? You could also think of it as what is the work being done by the net force? And so you want to think about then what is the net force on this object? And what is the work that that net force is doing? We'll stop for about 10 more seconds. 145. Send your answer if you want. And we're sort of switching. You guys are almost evenly split between these two answers. A couple of you have one of the other answers. But almost evenly split between these two answers. And one of the answers is correct. Let me tell you something about work. If I have a positive work, if I have an object and I'm doing positive work with one force and negative work with another force, you know what the total work is? They add up together. So I can add positive work and I can add negative work. And that means that one force is contributing energy, one force is taking away energy. And so that would give me a total work that would be something less than either one. Stop at 232. Okay, good. B is the right answer. Listen, we'll see this, and we'll work some problems, and you'll have some on your exam like this, too, uh, where I have one force that's doing positive work, one force that's doing negative work, but since these are both equal, I know they're equal because the acceleration equals zero, then together they're doing no work at all. The net force on this thing is zero, and so the net force is doing no work at all. back to kinetic energy theory. Okay, let's try this um, quick test. Again, you'll have to, this is a good example of, of one that you'll have on the test. Uh, you will have to do a dot product, and that's really your first job here is to do the dot product. I give you the force, and I give you the displacement. Actually, I don't even give you the full displacement. I give you the initial and the final position. And to find the displacement, do you all have this? Yeah. Okay, to find this, I take the difference in this. So remember, uh, displacement is the difference in final and initial. So that's going to be your first job is to find the displacement and then do the dot product with the force. that. I'll help you with the, the next part because it's something we haven't seen yet. your displacement. I think some of you have that now. Now I want to dot this with my force, which is actually the same, 3i plus 4j. Take the dot product of f dot b. Uh, in case you didn't catch this, I, I think this is probably not how to do this, but 
when I say I subtract these, I'm subtracting the vectors. But now that our vectors are written in vector notation, it's a whole lot easier to subtract them. I don't have to do all the business that we did before. I just subtract the x component, let's say 3.25 minus 0.25, and subtract the y component, 4.5 minus 0.5. And that's how I get this 3i plus 4j. We'll most, almost exclusively work with vectors in vector notation from here on out. Uh, next semester, we'll, uh, well we might see some vector addition like we've done before, but mostly we'll do it this way, which is a lot easier. Got our dot products yet? What is the work that's being done on this object? I know it's just a value. Remember, it's scalar quantity. Uh, no, it's not 9. I don't think. No, it's not 9. It's 25. Let me show you. I'll do 3i plus 4j. That's my 4. Dotted with 3i plus 4j. I do the FOIL thing, although you can probably look at this now and not worry about doing FOIL, because really I'm just multiplying these two, and then these two, and then adding them up. I go here, I say I. Where else do I have an I over here when I multiply those? I look here and I have a J. I say, where else do I have a J over here and I multiply those? So I have 3 times 3 plus 4 times 4, and that's equal to 25. 9 plus 16 is 25. Okay, now D, we haven't gotten to this, but power. Actually, I had a friend named Power. Isn't that funny? Like his parents named him Power, huh? I know, yeah. He's been kind of having a rough time. His supervisor's been making him work overtime. Because power is work overtime. Okay? You get it? All right, I've got a friend named Power. I just made that up. I lied to you. But power is work overtime. Okay? Um, and we'll get to this later in the chapter. But for now, let's just, it's not going to come up that much. But power is just the amount of work that you do over time. That's where horsepower comes in. That's where watts, that's a measure of power, like on your electrical devices. It's a measure of energy or work over time. So how do we find the power? So now we know the work. And you know the time, because it says that after two seconds, it does this. So calculate the power. What's the power? 12.5. Yeah, we'll call it 13. So 25 divided by 2 seconds, which is in joules. That's a 5. Uh, so let's call that 13. And the unit for power is the what? The watt. Right, it's the watt. Uh, it's just like on your electrical devices. You see watts on your electrical devices, 100 watt bulb. That means it puts out 100 joules per second of energy. Okay, what is the mass of the particle? This is sort of getting into stuff that we've done before. Uh, the mass of the particle, I give you a little hint here. X is equal to one-half AX T squared. Uh, I need to find out what is the, what is A. So I look at what is uh, X. X is equal to three meters because my displacement here is 3i, that's equal to 1 half ax times 2 seconds squared. So that's the hint that I give you. Carry this on out. We want to know now what is the mass of the particle. Think about what is the force that causes this acceleration, which you can solve for. And then the second law, which you know the force and the acceleration in the x directions in this particular case, then I can figure out what is the mass of that particle.
is what I got for the acceleration solving this. I got three halves or 1.5 meters per second squared. What is the force that we use? What is it? No, 25 is the work. I want to know the force in the x direction. What is the force in the x direction? It's 3 newtons. Go back to our vector notation. You see, I wrote our force right here. 3i plus 4j. It's 3 newtons in the x direction, 4 newtons in the y direction. Make sure you know how to use this vector notation, because we're going to be using it a lot more in coming chapters. So my force is fx, which is 3 newtons. My a I found here. And then we can find the mass. What does it work out to be? It's 2, right. So it's uh, 3 newtons over 3 halves meters per second squared. And that's equal to 2 kilograms. The final part, part D here, you don't know how to do yet. But I'm going to go ahead and show you in these last couple minutes. And then you'll see problems like this on the exam. It'll just be more familiar when we cover it in class. You probably know some of the language because I'm sure you had it in physical science in high school. But work causes some change in kinetic energy. And so when I do 25 joules of work, that will equal to some change in kinetic energy. And kinetic energy is equal to 1 half mv squared. So I can figure out the speed. If I do this work on an object of 25 joules, that's equal to one half of the mass, which is two kilograms, times v squared. And that works out to be v equals five meters per second. It's going to be a big part of some of the problems that we'll do. They'll get more complicated than this, but that same idea will still be true. If I do work on an object, I change its energy. If I do positive work, I increase its energy. And that's what we've done here. Is I've increased its energy, giving it a certain speed. Okay? Right, we'll call it quits there. But uh, y'all get some rest, okay? Got a bunch of sleepy heads. Y'all not usually this sleepy. Y'all usually stay alert. <laughs>